I've said it's a pleasure, and it's truly a pleasure to introduce uh, Mary Casamano, um, also from the Johns Hopkins team. Um, uh, Mary Casamano, MS, she's going to speak on love and connection in psilocybin facilitated mystical experience research. Um, Mary Casamano, MSW, is currently with the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She has served as study guide and research coordinator for the psilocybin studies for over 16 years. Um, during that time, she has been a session guide involved with all of the psil psilocybin studies. <coughs> Pardon me. And has conducted over how many? Conducted over 380 sessions. Just think about that, 380 psilocybin sessions uh, for, for, for subjects, for patients. She has trained uh, postdoctorate fellows, research assistants, and interns as assistant guides. Um, and as this research continues, it just disseminates out, and the training programs are there. And now they're training um, uh, new researchers with active doses of the psychedelic substances, so they know what they're giving to the subjects. She's uh, administered the psychological evaluations for psilocybin studies as well as other studies in the Behavioral Biolo Biology Research Unit. In addition to her work with the psilocybin studies, she's been involved with the salvia divinorum, dextromethorphan, and club drug studies conducted at Johns Hopkins. She taught individual and group meditation to breast cancer patients at, in jo a Johns Hopkins research study and taught at the California Institute for Integral Studies for their psychedelic assisted therapies and research program. She's also had 15 years of experience with direct patient care uh, as a hospice volunteer. As Al uh, Garcia Romeo, or maybe it was Fred Barrett, said, Mary is an impeccably beautiful human being, and it's such a perfect description of her. So um, you will find as you, as you hear her talk. So please help me welcome Mary Casamano. Thank you, Neil. I know. Thank you so much. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Your presence here means a lot to me. A um, couple quick things. Uh, the best thing about my talk is going to be when it's over. Because if you want to stay, um, Alex, Cody, Tamara, and myself are going to lead a little exercise of kind of singing a, si a song and a little kind of dance. It's kind of be, going to be like bringing love and connection together. But Alex has this great, deep, booming voice, and um, we invite you to that. Um, so the other thing is this room is big, and when I was um, waking up this morning thinking how big it was and connecting, I thought... It's Sunday, then I thought it's high noon, and then I remembered that I have a certificate of a minister. You know, you um, go online and pay $15, $18. And then I thought of um, church when I grew up, and my favorite thing, probably the only thing I liked about it, was a handshake of peace. So if you just want to take a moment to look at your neighbor and give them a handshake or a hug or a wave or a kiss. or um, so. so thank you. <laughs> So love and connection. Yeah. Okay. And as you settle in your seat, I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. And just, you know, the conference has been really intense. And um, a lot's happened. So just take a moment to think about, you know, people have been here a few days, they've been here a week, of all the different things that have happened. The um, people that you've reconnected with, the new connections that you've made, the meals you've shared, the talks that you've heard, walking outside in the sunshine. Just think about that and think about the ones that were special or meaningful to you. And just think about what, why that was. And so that's what my talk is about. Um, I believe that our true nature is love. I believe that love is connection to ourselves, to others, and to everything. There's so many reasons that we become disconnected. And psilocybin seems to act as a key to open our minds and allow access to our true nature and get that connection back. Having been an integral part of the studies from the onset, I will present to you why I believe these experiences of love and connection are among the most important outcomes of our studies and can um, play a critical role in producing sustained positive effects. This is my personal belief, but I didn't figure out how to click this before, so I'm not sure I know how to do it.
So I, I guess I'm going to need help because um, it's not, I don't know how to click it. Sorry about that. So I couldn't have done it without all my colleagues at Johns Hopkins. This list that comes up is going to be the current list. Okay, thank you. The one that says go forward. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is the current list. There have been many in the past, and of course our funders. I am grateful to them all. So, how many of you realize that the summer of love was 50 years ago? The summer of 1967. So the prelude to the summer of love was the human being, and... Um, that, oh, uh, yes, and that, well, it was 50 years ago. I saw this article in Alternet. The first line said that the event was born of the simple intention to unite people in the name of connection and love. And I had already had my title, so I thought that was amazing. So the prelude to the summer of love was in um, Golden Gate Park in January 14, 67. That's when Timothy Leary shouted, turn on, tune in, drop out. Um, um, Grateful Dead guitarist Bob Weir said, yes, there was LSD, but um, Haight-Ashbury was not about drugs. It was about exploration, new ways of expressing, being aware of one's existence. The San Francisco Oracle, a new concept of celebrations must emerge so a revolution can be formed of compassion, awareness, love, and a revelation of unity for all mankind. So 50 years later, here we are at Psychedelic Sciences, and I'm talking about how I believe our research speaks to this intention of love and connection in the summer of love. So there's something else I'd like to mention that was really meaningful to me in regard to this topic, and that is um, Rick Doblin's talk, Will Psychedelic Medicine Transform Culture? He mentioned it in the beginning of his um, talk when we started. And um, he was just beginning to be a psychedelic researcher, interested, and he had read this book by Robert Mueller, um, uh, New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. Um, Robert Mueller was Assistant Secretary General of the UN, known as the mystic of the UN. And um, in his book, he said he believed that um, really what was needed for world peace was a global spirituality. And so Rick thought this was awesome, but he realized psychedelic drugs therapy wasn't included. So he wrote to Mueller. He said he felt giving MDMA could help with that. Mueller actually wrote back to him and agreed. And so with his blessing and endorsement, Rick sent MDMA to a variety of religious leaders, asked them to take it and report back. And among two that did were Brother David and Rabbi Shakter Zalman, Sh Shalami and with powerful endorsements. And so he and Mueller began designing a study um, with religious leaders and giving them MDMA. But soon MDMA became a Schedule One drug and that didn't happen. So these past two events resonate strongly with me. The summer of love's intention of love and connection and Rick and Robert Mueller's belief in a global spirituality and that psychedelics could help with that. Um, I feel that now more than ever, um, a global coming together in love and connection is paramount. And I believe and have witnessed psychedelics as having the ability to assist with that. So how did I come to this belief? About the year 2011 is when I began to feel the need to put into words what I believed was happening in these studies that I'd been a part of for over a decade at the time, I had run hundreds of sessions, and we had completed some studies with astounding results. And so um, the study participants' experiences, my personal journey, our study results and relevant literature represent how I came to these conclusions. So at the time that I started writing, I, got a, I had a block, and at the time I was reading A Movable Feast by Ernest Hemingway, and I, it just popped into my head. I remember he said, um, whenever you have a hard time writing, um, write the truest sentence that you know. So immediately what came to mind for me was not a sentence, but a word, and the word was love. And so I believe that what humans really want is to give and to receive love. And I believe that love is what connects us to each other, and that such a connection is brought about by being intimate with each other, by sharing ourselves with each other. Um, very often we're afraid to open ourselves to this connection, so we put up barriers and we wear masks. But if we're able to let down our defenses, let the masks go, we can begin to know our, and accept ourselves and then allow ourselves to give and receive love. So 
Um, so that was the last slide. Okay, so um, this TED Talk by Brene Brown on the power of vulnerability, she states the importance this connection is on a deep level. Briefly, she states that connection is why we're here. It's what gives meaning and importance to our life. The way to connect is by being vulnerable, and that means being able to face our fears openly and honestly. But because this honesty could risk a connection, we shut down, cover up, and fake it. And her answer for overcoming these fears is courage. So, what is it that enables our study participants to face their fears and to reconnect with their true nature? I believe it's a combination of our preparatory integration meetings and guided psilocybin sessions. In our preparatory meetings, we aim to create a space where our participants feel safe and secure so they have the story to to have the courage to tell the story of who they are, all their fears, joys, disappointment, and shames without the fear of being rejected. So after their story has been told and trust established, the psilocybin session follows. Um, in order to achieve maximum benefit from this, to, in order to have maximum benefit and access these deep states of love and connectedness, I believe that it's necessary to be relaxed in both body and mind. When we're stressed, anxious, or afraid, we hold ourselves in and we tense our bodies. And these states of mind and postures keep us from being able to relax and expand our consciousness. In order to relax, a safe and trusting environment is necessary, and I believe that ideally our preparation has provided that. Now, my awareness of this necessity of relaxing was actually due to a number of our participants who pointed it out to me. And this one, after his third session, he was in the dose effect study, began to realize the importance of this. And this awesome quote he wrote is, I am again acutely aware of the dramatic effects of relaxing to the drug. Each time I let my shoulders sink into the couch with an exhalation of breath, or consciously soften my abdomen and leg muscles, the hallucinated space before me expands to astonishing dimensions. The onset of revelatory experiences, too, seems to correspond to my success in remaining relaxed. This relaxed and expansive state often leads to this sense of love and connection, which are recurrent themes in our psilocybin experiences. In Love 2.0, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, an expert in emotions, says love is our supreme emotion. Its presence or absence in our lives influences everything we think, feel, do, and become. Love is far more ubiquitous than you ever thought possible for the simple fact that love is connection. So two of our participants nail it with these quotes. I was reveling in the undeniable feeling of infinite love, I said to myself, I am love, all I ever want to be is love, all other goals in life seem completely stupid. <laughs> Once I was past the darkness, I began to feel an increasing feeling of peace and connectedness, and all that mattered were the connections with the wonderful people who are my family and friends. So by now, most of you are well aware of our study results. The majority of participants had significant increases in personal meaning, life satisfaction, and spiritual significance that produced positive changes in mood, behavior, and attitude that lasted more than a year later. In addition were the findings that having a mystical experience predicts these sustained positive effects and was consistent in all our studies with all of our volunteers. It also correlated with having an increase in the personality domain of openness. I believe that these study results are what allows us to connect to our true nature, to love. So I'm going to go over three of our studies that illustrate this. In our cancer study, I observed that many of our cancer patients came into our study often feeling very disconnected, um, from them, not only from their place in the world, but also, more importantly, from themselves. Often, um, 
once you have a cancer diagnosis, your life changed dramatically. Sometimes you lose your jobs or you're um, too weak to continue them. Outward appearances can change, losing your hair. Um, what once gave meaning and purpose to their lives often now seems meaningless. One participant said, once you have a cancer diagnosis, you feel like the walking dead. Another said she felt that she was living like she had already died. One of the questions in our screening process is, do you feel empty inside? And a majority of our participants answered yes to that. I believe it was due to this loss of a sense of self and life meaning. Our cancer study often enables them to get that connection back to believing that they're worthy of love and connection. So these are two quotes. At some point, I realize that compassion for self is critical. I find myself essentially divided into two. I make friends with myself. I'm okay. Another, my depression lifted completely. I was able to get out of the cancer world and back to myself and able to connect with others and better care for her partner. Our smoking study. What is it that the addicted smoker has forgotten or is disconnected from that keeps him or her smoking? In our preparatory meetings, we explore these issues, build trust, gather data on smoking habits, and discuss with them what it means to be a non-smoker. We then help them create a mantra or a phrase to encapsulate that feeling. The following mantra was formulated by one participant when she recalled her life before she was smoking, when she was a young girl riding her bike down a country road. I am living my life as I did when I was young, with insouciance, freedom, and joy. So by repeating this mantra, brought to mind an image and a state of self, a state of, an image of self and state of mind that she wanted to reconnect with, and she was successful in quitting. Another participant enrolled at a very difficult time in her life. She felt quite hopeless that anything could help her quit smoking. She felt trapped and unhappy in many areas. Fortunately, she was open-minded. She successfully quit smoking and made major changes in her personal and professional life. At the close of her second session, she realized that, she had, that smoking had mastered depression. And she wrote at her six-month follow-up, I do feel this study helped me remember who I was outside of what my life had become. I believe that I was depressed, and that's the reason I went back to smoking in the first place. The study allowed me to look at the feelings of depression and process them instead of distracting myself from using them by using nicotine. She really felt that she had gotten her old self back. Her mantra was breathe, and she had an experience where she just felt she was breathing, and it all went back to this state where she was um, in the state of her pure, she felt, um, oneness. So I think our study outcomes suggest that smoking study design, together with high-dose psilocybin sessions, having a mystical experience, may help us break um, addictive thought and behavior patterns and help us to reconnect to our true nature. So our fifth study, our spiritual practices study, it was really this study that helped me to put into words my belief that our studies are about this reconnection to our true or authentic self. And the realization came about because of the meaning, because of the word spiritual and, um, in our study, the practices study. And so in the screenings, I realized that there was a difficulty or a disconnect that many were experiencing due to this word spiritual. Um, the word spiritual and religious both have a lot of baggage. And I believe that deep down, the essence of our studies is well beyond either of these words. And so that's when I began writing to figure it out. And I felt that the word authentic or true self was more accurate. And it seemed to resonate with many of our participants. And this one wrote, The whole journey was on a spiritual plane where thoughts, understanding, and words are completely 100% irrelevant. I was in the playground of trust and knowing. I was free from the binds of my overactive mind. I was free from density. I was in my element. I was, this is my home. This is what I know is my true self. So the case study that I'm about to present 
is not one that I would have readily thought of when thinking of doing one of love and connection. But after being encouraged by one of my colleagues, by Cody, um, I realized that indeed it was one of love and connection, although not in the classic way. So this participant was 30 years old female. She was one of our youngest cancer participants, and she was also one of the sickest. She had stage four breast cancer that had metastasized to her liver and lungs. Her doctors wouldn't give her a prognosis, but based on her research, believed she had two years at best. She was also the single mother of a seven-year-old boy. The fact that she came to our study meant that she must have had some kind of hope, but it certainly wasn't imp 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 apparent in her presentation. She was very guarded and resistant to open up and to share anything about her situation or her feelings around it. My ability to connect with her was challenging, and it seemed that so much of what I said was ju just met with indifference or frustration. I did learn that most of her relationships were similar, not accepting help and closing herself off, um, but that was how she was able to cope with her situation. That was how she was able to get by in her daily life. So how did I handle this? Not very well. I struggled with trying to figure out what to do, and it really was agonizing. Here was this beautiful young woman with a terminal illness and a young child, and I wasn't able to help her. What can you do if someone doesn't want to open up and to connect? There was only one thing I finally realized that I could do, and that was to stop thinking that I could help her and to offer her unconditional love. And so our time together continued. During our meetings, and many times outside of our meetings, I focused on sending her love. Her first session started out with images around cancer-related issues, but by the end of the day, she had experiences of peace and joy and feelings of interconnectedness. But by the one-month follow-up, she said that although she had tried to be positive, she felt mostly negative and irritated, and she expressed anxiety and disappointment that the session didn't change her outlook. I continued sending her love silently. So her second session began with a significant amount of struggle and resistance, and at one point she felt she was going insane. In her next day session report, she said there were times when she felt trapped, alone, and angry at herself, and wrote, I feel I'm the only person blocking my happiness, as though some people just are happy, and I am just not. She struggled with this for a while, and was finally able to stop. At this point, she let me hold her hand. She became very emotional, and she cried. And it was something that she didn't let herself do in the past. Shortly after, a deity appeared to her, and it was very comforting, which was really interesting to her because she had no religious or spiritual beliefs or practices. In her six-month follow-up, she stated that the experience had been extremely valuable and that her life had taken a definite change of course. Her anxiety and depression decreased dramatically, and of spiritual significance, she said, Understanding that believing in God is not a completely foreign concept that I previously felt unable to understand. Now I feel that I can understand, and it is not too different from not believing. Of the many positive behavior changes, she reported one of the most significant as the change in her mental flexibility and open-mindedness. She rated it as extreme. This shift enabled her to connect with people who in the past she would have been critical and shut out of her life. She wrote, instead of, being instead of being upset because their actions are not something that resonates with me, I am able to better see their intent and accept that goodness. She experienced a renewed and more committed interest in her career and in a volunteer project that she had been involved with in the past. She began taking better care of herself physically with her diet and exercise and consciously by not inflicting guilt on herself. One of her, friend, one of her phone raters, who was a friend and psychologist, remarked that her general demeanor had shifted and appeared that her life concerns and, and, her life concerns and stress seemed to have diminished noticeably and significantly. 
He said that she was much more accepting of herself and others and much more at ease with who she is and what's going on in her life. And I love this. He added that the shift was gradual. Like when you slow cook something, you let it stew and it comes out delicious. And so no, she didn't have the all is one sacred mystical experience that so many others have had and with transformative experiences. But was there a shift in a transformation? Absolutely. She went from disconnecting from her daily life and to most of those around her to opening herself to their love and compassion and that allowed her to have more conne connection to life and to others. So finally, these quotes that I'm going to show you support my belief that a psilocybin-assisted experience can offer a means to reconnect to our true, authentic self, to love. I am more interested in connecting with, on a deeper level and value relationships more. I am more open and less judgmental. I have a greater sense of love as being the unifying and principal force of the universe and as the appropriate response to my understanding of reality. And another, everything is swept up into a climatic epiphany as love is the universal essence and meaning of all things. The journey of spirit coming to itself, revealing to itself its own inner mystery, is nothing more but the self-realization of love. And this last one, I just couldn't have written a better one for this talk. My single strongest memory will be from the first session when I found myself chasing something that had been eluding me. When I caught it, I discovered that it was me. The subsequent embrace and rejoining seems to be to be the single most important event of my life. I feel whole for the first time and able to cope with anything. Apart, I was weak and directionless, listless really, but together I'm strong, capable of anything, and just happier. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mary, Mary Casamano. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm so nervous, and um, I just wanted to do justice to our many amazing um, participants and all that have done in the research. So thank you so much. Um, this love has been a theme throughout my whole life, and having been involved in these studies and seeing that that's what this is about and that's what can bring um, together, I feel... Like I said, that more than ever, I feel a global coming together in love and connection is paramount and that psychedelics can help with that. So thank you all for being a part of this movement that we're coming to. And if you want to laugh and dance and, and get connected with an experiential exercise, please come up and join us. Alex, Cody, Tamara, um, well, we might as well meet down here. So anyone who wants to, it's going to be really awesome if you like that kind of thing. Um, we love you, Mary. You will we not, love you. You will not be sorry if you like that kind of thing. Hey. It's mm -hmm. so sweet.